from in, uh, in, in, in our world because we have a way through mediation and arbitration of dealing with uh, with, uh, with with problems. Okay. How how are we doing for time? Okay, tell me. How much time do we have? Did you do you have a couple of minutes? Okay. How many? Did you do you have <coughs> part of an hour? I said part of an hour. Part of an hour. Okay. 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 Very good. Okay. All right. Let's try and do that. Okay. The method that I'm people is the two hands of Oromo tribe. All of Oromo are divided into Borana and Baretuma. Two hands. And historically, these two hands were intermarrying groups. So, uh, Borana has to marry, so they marry uh, uh, and vice versa. Now, we've been told by Abba Bahari and by many other scholars after Bahari that these were tribes, two tribes, separate tribes, and that one went left, headed toward uh, Shaw, Wallaga, Gire, the Borana, and the Maretuma went straight north, all the way to Raya, straight south, all the way to, to uh, Orma. Now, uh, when I looked at Borana itself, are the Borana all Borana? Maybe you think they are not. They are half Borana, the other half is Barekuma. They say Saglan Borana, Sagaltama Borana, Saglan Borana, Sarban Barituma. So yeah, they have both Barituma and, and, and uh, Borana. How come? If, they, if, if there are really two tribes that have gone through two different ways, why is it that we have both of them? So I dug into this and found that you find both moieties present in every part of the Roma country. The name may change, but when you look at the, 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 the clan regime, you can tell which is Borana and which is which is Barakuma. So because they are society, they never have been. They are always interlocked with each other. The only do not have Barakuma. That they say they're all Borana and that the people, the other half of their society is Gavarro. Gavarro are assimilated Indians. So I don't believe that an entire moiety can disappear just because we have broken from from Salama. No way. So I'm going to have to travel to Wilberga and find out what happened, what happened to the other moiety. If we have to go by the door, or you may talk about the other, but we have to go inside and look at the reality to see what happened. It's amazing. And uh, the first six years persuaded the Gavaro. The Gavaro were They didn't accept that that should be part of the status. So they rebelled. Uh, they were called the Azar, uh, was forced by this. And uh, the six years persuaded them to talk over there the land and set them into a judge. So they had a whole bunch of them. They disappeared completely. They were completely assimilated into a judge. There was no place for them. Except for their proponents go compound by the genealogy, they go back four or five generations and they expect to turn into a long way. So they just do very much, but they're being completely all assimilated. So in a way, uh, the rewrites, as I said earlier on, are a big violation of all that. When you cross them, you change your life completely. And you never settle on both sides of a river. If you do, the two sides will be able to be touched. And that happened in Orma. In Orma, what they did was they migrated southward in two groups at two different times. One went deep inside Somalia and back and settled on the left bank of the, of the river Tana. The other went straight to the south and settled on the right bank of the Tana River. They now have become two tribes that are totally alienated from each other. So, I'm betting, like when I left here, I asked people uh, who, where are the uh, Gideon Indians? 
are they on the left bank of the river? All the way to the river, on the left bank of the river. Yes, they are. <laughs> and who is on the other side? Some other people. <laughs> so, clearly, the norm that I'm uh, proposing is that rivers are a big barrier to our home. And five millicons for all like the Christian Highlanders, among other figures, are acrophobic. I call, I call it acrophobia. Fear and hatred of water. I'm not a big season. What am I doing? What am I doing? As you as you do. So there's fear that is unhappy about being taken silently or likely taken away just like that. And then because of that, they don't swim. Historically, they don't swim. Uh, I think they didn't hear it from others. They didn't swim either. You know? And so, uh, there's no reason why our book cannot learn to swim and learn to navigate across rivers, you know, pampas or rafters. Just, just tie rafters together and with a stick you can push yourself uh, across, across the river and do it safely without being exposed to the pampas. So, so, one solution is to try and uh, Get people to understand how to deal with, with navigation uh, on rivers, crossing rivers, but also how to uh, how to protect each other from the from the people people are not really good that violent, but crocs are really really violent. Really <coughs> so uh, that and also the project I have given here for project that I'm thinking about is really to make it safe for people to use uh, and get access to, to the river to not be able to use the <coughs> So, I think uh, I'd like to set aside a little bit of time for questions and answers. So, I'll stop here uh, and uh, we'll respond to questions and answers to the issues that I'm doing. As we have expected, it was highly important, lively, and there were quite a good vision lectures that we have come out. We thank you very much again, and we are also honored and privileged to have you on campus. And so, before uh, going into answering questions, <coughs> I invite two moderators to the stage, Mr. Deletti and Deletti, to come on the stage. And now we, we bounce the stage back for the audience so that we can have uh, opinions and voices of the great left, which may be later on others, but as well. Thank you. Society uh, in Lord's room, away from. I have never imagined to 
come face to face in life because especially when he wrote this, he was saying, now I am 75 years old and uh, our children are now living together. And when I went to India for my PhD, Libanja uh, Lisa <coughs> has passed power over to Buyogo Babli. And as a matter of chance, when I come back to go to Borana, Buyogo Babli was uh, reading the Borana to Bumidayo, and I was fortunate enough to participate on it too. And, and, but I have never imagined things change like this in a tremendous and unexpected way. And I am so glad to be on your side, to sit beside you today. <laughs> and I am really fortunate. And uh, maybe people have said a lot about Professor Asmaro, but I feel something is missed from what has been said by Dr. Jamal, Dr. Tashone, uh, Ernias, and Hagan as well. Uh, because Professor Asmaro is rebellious himself. I see, and that he can even keep that from his family. I think so, because how your uh, uncle is explained and how you also followed that at your high school uh, when you were this and scholarship and finally related in the standard then sent to Makarari and then expelled from Makarari to come to Absaroba University and Again, what you have done on anthropology, especially Gaza system, I always remember the Pacific Gaza system, the Western theoreticians or Western uh, <coughs> researchers consider Gaza normal. It is, Professor Karam says, it is an instrument which is incapable to capture data. And that's why we use these three approaches and that as a method of inquiry is a very big call for our universities to, to, to uh, see a different view of um, studying society instead of just regurgitating what the Westerners have already said and the privilege and now from saying this I don't know whether Tagan has something to add but I want to give back to the floor to, to, to ask questions and uh, I begin from I don't know whether yeah I, I see I don't know whether I have to go from Left to right or right to left? How do the board do? Left to right. Left to right. Okay. You are one. Okay. For the time being, I see only one answer. Thank you, Professor Rasmaro, for uh, the lively uh, public sector. I have one question uh, regarding the approach of the methodology of color uh, and in places like the American tradition, they tend to be quantitative and they tend to observe uh, phenomena in an aggregate form. Try to summarize uh, phenomena in terms of the percentage of frequencies and uh, in the French cultural tradition uh, there is a tendency to study social structure and use it as uh, an explanation uh, for an observable phenomenon. So when you apply these two or uh, three approaches, how do you find the balance? Uh, for example, in British sometimes it needs structures that uh, biased, uh, biased researchers 
to focus on uh, things which cannot be uh, internalizable. So, how do you find the balance for uh, different schools of thought in approaching the data? Uh, Is this the one? Uh, yes, balancing the three approaches is maybe desirable, but it's not essential uh, because each method uh, exposes a different aspect of, of the society. So if you're using the British method, every time there's conflict, you're going to dig in and study the conflict in depth. Uh, but that's not enough. I mean, you, you don't understand how people think about their society. What are the what are the images that they have in their mind that causes them to behave the way they do? Uh, what do they think is good and evil? The entire ethical system is is a system of beliefs. You know, it's not a, an external uh, thing. So, uh, so I would say one has to be opportunistic. The kind of conflicts that the, the, the British should focus on happen. You don't bring them about. They happen, but when they do happen, are you there to observe them and to do it uh, and to do it in depth uh, investigation? So, uh, so balancing is not important. I don't think. What is important is that you have the astuteness to realize that something is happening that should be documented. Really, I mean, like, would be crisis in. Uh, Huh? People were deeply moved by that, you know. And journalists will do a fairly good job of, of documenting that, documenting that. But it requires more, more than just journalistic coverage. So you engage in this conflict. How is the conflict going to resolve? What methods are going to be people are going to bring about to <laughs> maybe punish the offenders, but also bring, bring the two groups together? The method of conflict resolution and consensus will be highly developed in our Highly developed. <laughs> <coughs> so, and to me, for that very reason, uh, I think Ami is a fascinating individual, because he thinks deeply about peacemaking and peace building and peaceful resolution of conflict and peaceful succession to power. All that comes from Nagaburana. Nagaburana is a system that has brought together five tribes, of which two are Somali clans. Nobody ever assassinated Somalis. Never. But Burana has actually been doing that. Gary and Duraka took Burana around Somali clans, who are assimilated by the Burana. They speak Romo and Somali. And they have developed their own Gara system. You know. <coughs> so, so, when you see something like that happening, do we have the mental acuity to say, aha, something is going on, conflict is erupted, it's going to be resolved, how is it going to be resolved? Documenting that is a very good way of, 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 of learning from, from the experience and benefit from benefit. So, not necessarily opportunity when it turns out. Takilu and then Nagga and third. Just Dr. Takilu first. Thank you very much, Professor Aslo. Thank you for encountering the local team. Maybe just I want to ask a very simple question for you. Uh, when I read your work, some people say that Professor Asma might not have really understood more because as anthropologist, he himself didn't have the great knowledge of Rome. And therefore, they say, of course, he might have missed a lot of things that still need deep, deeper investigation. Also, how do you 
Sí, sí, sí. sí. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Charles, uh, when I read the material uh, together on the three, with three approaches, uh, I was fascinated with uh, two points. The first one is using these three approaches in the single study uh, at PhD level, verified. Uh, the scholars are advised to it's best, very much special uh, than having this broader uh, up. Second was how do you manage uh, to undertake a study uh, or, or get or see uh, or, or get a uh, project. So partly uh, I, 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 I think I got uh, uh, part of your uh, background because you told us that the school belonged was a multidisciplinary type of approach, so we were encouraged to have such broader uh, perspectives in a single state. So now my question is, do you still suggest researchers uh, in this whole to follow the same thing of having multiple approaches in a single state, or uh, you think that is specific to Ghana because of its broadness and your background uh, of uh, your school. I think my question is clear. Do you suggest us to follow the same way, having multiple approach in a single state, or might be uh, admitted based on the type of uh, issue we handle in all these Uh, thank you, Professor Admiral, uh, for this chat work and also for the nice presentation. And uh, one simple question I would like to ask is that uh, the uh, is uh, you think that your study will work on better system is exhaustive? Do uh, you think that much has been done or achieved in your work? The second question is uh, you suggested that at the end of the day you may propose a sort of restructuring the data system or to make it perhaps more dynamic system. Uh, really, I suppose that the GEDA system is a really very complex system, and uh, in the process of restructuring, don't you think that it may violate uh, or it is core values or inherent values in this restructuring process? This is my question. <laughs> Okay, if you don't if you don't speak the language, how do you go about studying a cancer? Uh, by hard work, very hard work. Uh, it takes nothing for granted. Uh, essentially, what I did was uh, I take and transcribe every word they answer. It's very laborious. Take and transcribe every word they answer. So I have what they said in Oromo, 
with quality transcription, accurately rendered, and then translate as carefully as possible. Text and translation side by publish. If you do that, uh, you are treating eyewitness testimony as precious information, and it is precious. But if you just listen to what they're saying and try to maybe jot a few notes from that and hope to capture the essence of what they're saying, you'll miss out on it. Because very often I don't understand what they're telling me. I go back and go over it and ask questions and slowly try to understand what it is that they're, that they're telling. So a miracle journey also didn't speak or either. But he has given us a wealth of information, documented very carefully, side by side translation, Robo and, 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 and English. And it's it's amazing how rich and informative that kind of that method of documentation is. Uh, so I would just I would say that uh, for people who don't speak the language, then the the whole method of, of documentation has to be very meticulously done and, and plus try take and transcribe. That's that's what's essentially our idea. You know. But but beyond that, also I I sat in on the uh, assembly meetings, just observing their behavior. Some of it I ab absorbed through observation, things that they do that I thought was extraordinary. At one stage, they were in, engaged in a very heated argument with each other. And they weren't listening to each other. When that happens, the organized has, has his antenna out. This is not working. So he tells them, rise to your feet. They rise to their feet. Face east. East is the way where they came from, the place, the place of origin. So they face east, and then he blesses them from behind. From behind them. That's the function of that. It is to pacify brain nerves and get them to begin to think and listen to each other and understand each other. So, it's a method of pacification, you know. And there are all kinds of parliaments in the world where people fight to the end and there's no, they're not listening to each other, you know. And what I'm saying is like this listen. Look for the best that others have said in order to win the common ground, not with the worst they have said in order, order to win an argument. A very wise, wise statement. What, what makes parliamentary procedures terrible is the fact that people are not listening to each other. And so, how do you get them to listen to each other? Well, by using blessing as a method of pacifying their tempers so that they can begin to listen to each other. So I was uh, attending an OSA conference in Toronto once, and the whole discussion was being conducted in English. There was an elderly RC gentleman dressed, and he got up after the presentations were over uh, and said, uh, you people want to talk about our culture and our institutions, but you speak in a language that we don't understand. So what's the point? And so, so the, the audience got split in half. Half saying he's right. We should stop talking to each other in English and do it only in a And the other half said, we have international scholars here who are participating. How can we do that and so on. So the, 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 the argument became very intense. So uh, Mohammed Hassan, who was a historian, brilliant guy, uh, was chairing the meeting. He said to the elder, No in peace, please bless us. He got up, turned toward the audience, and started blessing them. And the whole thing came down. Tempers were pacified. Like reasonably debating again. It's a very, very intelligent way of classifying brain nerves, you know? 
And there are panels in the world where people go at each other with chairs and they throw in pieces of furniture on each other. Yeah? So clearly, these are not nations that have developed the tactics that Rome has developed to make it possible for people to listen to each other. They used to tell me, because I'm fast in, 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 in my speech, they said, slow down, slow down, slow down, think. You can't, you're not giving yourself an opportunity to think. <laughs> so I, I train, I talk to them, you know. It's, 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 they have psychological methods of making things work that are very intelligent, very humane, very understanding of what makes for good communication, what makes for disruptive, disruptive of communication. Yeah, that question. I think that guy, I don't know whether I have paraphrased appropriately, but what you are, the first question is, uh, the institution to which you have been to is multidisciplinary. How you come to understand the deep knowledge, or get the deep knowledge of the three approaches? Uh -huh. yeah, am I right? Maybe. Uh, my point is, nowadays, uh, we are advised to use a single perspective. Yes. Uh, but in your case, you have three approaches, yes. many, many things in each of them. Yes. Uh, so my basic is, do you suggest us to follow the same way, mm -hmm. having multiple approaches in a single study? Yes. Or do you think that it is specific or unique to you stay together? Right. So that's my question. Right. I, I, uh, uh, a lot of people will say uh, we are in a hurry to finish our dissertations. We just use one, one method, see it through, and, and be done with it. You know. But the point is that you impoverish yourself by doing that, because uh, if you ignore the cognitive system in the in the system. You would never be able to understand why, why and how Borana survived these severe droughts that they're going through. It's knowledge that does that. They, they have, I, I have identified 400 plants that Borana identified for, for, for different reasons. Some of them are poisonous, others are good food, others are good food for their, food. Food food for their uh, animals and not human concerns and so on. Uh, one of the things that they do when they go to a new place is, by the way, they watch their goats and their, their dogs to see what they are eating, what they are avoiding. Because if they are poisonous, they will know first before you do. So you watch, you watch how they how selective they are. So you throw observations that they can help to, to survive uh, uh, different, different, uh, different environments. So I would say uh, the multiple approach keep them in your toolkit. You don't necessarily have to go out and apply each method. But opportunistically, when the event takes place and you're better equipped to study what will happen, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't be, be bothered with or observing the clips among the people that they study. And if I did do that, it would have, I'd have lost a very important part of, of the knowledge that, that, that I collected. So one has, to, one has to be really opportunistic. So when when the rituals were being performed in, in, in Burana, they were compact. They all happened at one place at one time, in the third year of the, of the Gada, Gada period. And I mobilized the host of the uh, research assistants to document every one of these rituals. You know, happens once in eight years. Unless you document it, you're, you've lost your, your opportunity. Paul Baxter, in 50 years of research among the Borana of Kenya, has not seen a single rite of passage, has not made a single Abagada, has never set foot in the Ola Bora. And so, what does he have? He's, he's impoverished himself. You know. The one and only ritual that is performed in, in Kenya. Uh, the, the Gadamuji ritual, the Gadamuji hand over ceremony. He never observed that. I've observed it twice, once in Ethiopia, the other time in, 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 in Kenya. So, uh, 
Partly, it's also a matter of respecting the culture that we're studying. So that you take it at face value, you take it as they want to tell it to you, not as you want to, to understand it. So there's a certain degree of humility that one has to have in order to pay attention to things that you may not cause, could, could consider important, but they will consider important so you, you document it. Calendars. Who studies calendars? Most anthropologists say calendars are not part of our research. You know how, how impoverished I would be if I didn't study the when I was talking about We would have never discovered the monuments that are 300 years before Christ. Two million years old. I was persistent in studying the, 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 the calendar, as made as, as full a record of it as I could, and then the astronomers saw it, saw what I wrote, and said, could this be right, you know? And they start investigating it from the astronomer's perspective. And they say, this thing works. This thing works. They haven't fully documented it properly, but the fundamentally the system works, you know? And so, uh, by assuming that the conventional topics that are uh, included in, in the curriculum of anthropologists, uh, you end up losing on very important things that happen to be happen to be important in the culture that we're studying. Forget anthropology, forget your curriculum. Focus on the things that they consider important. So the calendar to Morana is terribly important. They are one of the few people in Africa who know their age accurately. They know that because they say, uh, how old are you? We ask them. Well, I was born in the Gada of Jardis Liga, in the fourth year of Jardis Liga. So I have four years from that era. Since then, two Gada periods have been completed. We are now in the third year of Gada uh, Goba, Bure. And so they say, all right, you add it up. <laughs> they know what they're raising, but they tell you add it up. So he said, four plus eight plus eight plus three. That's it, that's their age. Exactly. It's an exact knowledge of, of, of age. So when you do, when you come to the censuses, my census of Boranda is the first census ever made among pastoralists that contains age information. If you don't have age information, you don't have a census. So the census that I published in the original Gada, I have now included it in my website in digital form, so that you don't have to enter the data again. Just go, go to it, take the data, and reanalyze it. There's a lot of stuff that you can get out of that census. Because it's unique. It's the first time that a survey has been made, uh, a census has been made of a pastoral society. So that's here to be analyzed. There's a lot of information in it that can be analyzed. You know. So, uh, uh, in a way, my plea is don't be conventional in the way you do research. When you find unusual things happening before you, go ahead and begin to begin to. Because you don't know how, what pay off it's going to uh, give you, you know? You, you, if you make too many assumptions, what's conventional, what is acceptable to anthropologists, what's not acceptable, that's, that's, that shouldn't be the guideline. The guideline should be the culture understanding what they consider important and take them very seriously. And they'll guide you through things that are very, very, very useful. Bob Bourbourg was my teacher, who now has, I think he got an honorary doctorate. Yeah. And he's coming to, to our meeting. Although with my teacher, I brought him to Addis Ababa, the best in 1985, was chaos in They said it's not safe for you to go. So I brought him up to Addis Ababa. He came with two other elders. Why? Because he can't trust himself. If he tells, gives me false information, he has two others who go to check him out. People are not careful about the way they transmit information and pass it on to others. So very, very truthful and very careful about being accurate with their, with their information. I don't know that was my first teacher and he was absolutely brilliant. I mean, he had in his mind the entire Gada chronology. And it's a very complex chronology because what they've done is they use the mathematical principle of fragmentation. So they have five bodhisattvas for 40 years duration. 
five color classes, and then arrange that like a grid. So you have five rows, five, five, five color classes, the next generation is another five. So you can arrange it in columns or in rows, right? Now, you can do that on, a, on, a, on an Excel sheet very easily. He does it mentally. So they have Makabasa Luba, which is seven names for Gada classes, which is superimposed on the five of this side. Five and seven. What happens? Permutation. My second principle of permutation is that you have five and seven permutators. Uh, it's like two wheels with five and seven cogs on it. You rotate them. After so many revolutions of the small wheel, so many revolutions of the large wheel, the two will come into alignment. So it is after five revolutions of the big wheel and seven revolutions of the small wheel, the two will come into alignment. That is the historical era that is closed. After that, history repeats itself. Okay? Now, our Ayala Mata doesn't have an extension, but he works as if he had an extension. So the Makabasa Luba shifts from one Bogisa to another until finally it comes back to the same Bogisa, right? Now he says, Ak Makabasa Wali Rahudani, on horizontal, or Ak Makabasa Wali Tarani, vertical column. And he can tell you. The seven names, how it moves from one progressor to another for eight generations and comes back to the same present column. All that is done without a single piece of paper or without any writing. Or when not. Now, this guy is a genius. There's a mathematician by the name of Martha Asher, who's a professor of mathematics at uh, Notre Dame University, who read this chapter and said these people are mathematicians. They're using the principle of, of, of permutation. So she wrote a book called Mathematics Elsewhere, meaning other than the Western world, and wrote a chapter on the mathematical concepts that Oromo used to organize their, their historic terminology. So you can, you can trivialize that and you, you'll miss out on a very important part of their culture. Of their, of their okay, let's come back on that more Okay. Do you feel that Gadara study is exhausted? Exhausted. Do you feel that Gadara is exhausted by you? Exhausted. No, 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 not at all. Another piece. Okay. Okay. Can we restructure Gadara as a different issue? It's a practical issue. But, uh, but the first part was what? Uh, exhausted. Exhausted. You never exhaust, exhaust the, the, the knowledge that is built into the Gada system. Never. You go on, document every Gumiga. Gumiga is going to take place next year. Next year, right? Yeah, next year. It has never been fully documented, ever. And yet, that is where Al Burana sit for eight days and think about their uh, political institutions and, if necessary, make new laws to replace the old ones. It's a very important event. It's been documented three times by myself, by Abdullah Shambhala, who was a teacher in, uh, in Moriate, who crossed over to Ethiopia to, to document uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Kurigara. And then a police officer, a Noro police officer, also became the governor of, of, of Morana. His name is... Uh, 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 is 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 they, if you want to understand the legislative history of Borana, then what you have to do is document every Gurigara that is performed in detail 
And it has been proven by now, new things emerge, new things that we didn't understand at that time. Two, two things that I discovered over the years is that not only do Borana make new laws, but they also make constitutional reform. They make introduce laws that change the function of their institutions and the relationship between their institutions. That is constitutional reform in a traditional society. This is, this is um, unheard of, unknown. And the, 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 the laws that they introduced was the, the electoral uh, authority to oversee elections was held by the Urakano only because the authority gave it to them. So it's, it was illegal. And so this was debated every, every Gada since I did my field research. And finally, Jelo Aga, who is a direct descendant of Dawa Gogo, who is the eighth lineal ancestor of Dawa Gogo. Dawa Gogo is a great lawmaker. So Jelo Aga was empowered by history to make the change. So a young man, he dominated the assembly, said, I'm going to do what, uh, what my ancestors did, and went ahead and changed the relationship between Lord Wadakandu and the world of Wadakandu. Removed the electoral authority from Lord Wadakandu and returned it back to our to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, Canada. This is, this is fundamental constitutional reform that they're talking about here. And they do that. So, but, but you don't observe this unless you are long-term research that goes from decade to decade. You don't have to do field work all that time, no. But you have somebody observing the situation and telling you what, what's happening. So I wasn't in Borana when these two laws were changed. But I had friends in Borana who keep track of this and send me email to say this is what Kuba Bula has done. Kuba Bula has eliminated the, uh, the abandonment of children who are not who are born before the majority, the father the, the senior lama grade. And that changes the whole the whole pattern of uh, of retirement in the environment. So so now you have people who are 16 years old for the development for the first time in history, they are always zero to eight years in the development. Now, because of the innovation that the government introduced, and I saw 60 year olds with the WHA head. So it's going to, the cycle opens on the inside now. So it's, the spiral will continue to expand on the inside as well as on the outside. So, it's an unstable system, and, and this is how it can come to us. Yeah. It's fine enough, but it's like a okay. tool. It's going to be released after Ghana. Oh. Yeah, but only by the time. The process of Israel is not going to be that Israel can violate the internal elements of the state. Well, to begin with, I wouldn't dream of uh, changing the Ghana system or the Borana, the traditional religious society, because they found a way of dealing with it. By re, re, by by reauthorizing the 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 it has started out as an ancient system before they imposed the generational rules at the time of the Great Migration because of the population of the that they had. So, uh, so going back to that is going to what Gedda was before the, before the Great Migration. So, so it's actually not violating uh, anything by, by doing that, but making it easier for people to stay in the system and not be thrown out of the, of the system and become disenfranchised. Plus, or third, so it's also women have to be part of the system. That's a new, a new thing that the Quran has to do. They have to be fully integrated into the system. They have the same institution, some people, some of them, RCU, I think Kujidu also, but not Quran. 
uh, uh, Sika institution, do you know, all you know what the uh, Sika institution is? Sika institution is a Sika in Howard, which is like the Betterment uh, Institute, you know, my own community, or uh, But it has significance in most societies that use the Sika institution to protect the rights of women. If a husband beats his wife irrationally, habitually, then what she does is she goes to the marketplace and you relate. Safe and so so on. So, so we use our data and they grab a hold of him and take him to, to justice. <laughs> Uh, and, and so there's no way that you can be be uh, violent toward women and not not be apprehended by by, by the CK institution. Now Borana does not that, and I said, how come? You know, why is that? I said, would you have it, but Borana does not. And they said, well, we had a meeting. Of, of all the meetings were held in Arsi, but we did and Borana came to, to, to the place for this meeting. In the, in the meeting where we decided to institutionalize the Sika institution, Borana ran out of Sink. Sink had a little bit of a budget. Come and say, like, I don't know. So they had in Yahoo, so now that number of this. Which is credible, you know. I mean, uh, why else would we say have it, but what? But, but, but Borana had sex, his language. To, to make up for this. They say, Sikke Moti, Worri Moti, Worri Isi, Isi Moti, Worri. They say, Sultan, Nusuk Nasta Dadra, so much, yeah, come on. Sikke Moti, Worri Isi Moti, Worri. This is sexist in Linda, they say, it's a That's because they never uh, adopted the Sikke institution. They have the Sikke. Sikke Moti, like the Sikke. Then the institution that protects the rights of women is not there. So clearly, here is room for innovation by making the sector institution bigger than it is now, by giving women a right, not just protection of their rights against the violent husbands, but also participating in the entire, in the entire political system equally. So that would be an innovation that would would be grateful to, to, to have. I don't think they look in the traditional society, but it can be done in the modern society. I know that if we grow more, we can get more from out of Professor Asmaron, but I think it is enough for a man of his age to talk as much as this. <laughs> I, I put myself as a standard. <laughs> because the more I put there, I, I, I cannot, I feel I cannot do more than two or two hours. <laughs> this is, this is like the new Gada, uh, and it is titled not the approaches to study of the society, but the more conditions of the world. It is the 46th anniversary of the uh, heritage edition. 46th anniversary of the first Gada that I published. But the new one is half of it is new material. It's 400 pages long, 200 pages are completely new material. And the other half is updated. So that whenever there's new information in the other chapters, I'll add it, I'll code that. Uh, to, to, to. On the back of it is the Borana astronomy calendar, the Borana Urji, the stars of Borana, lined up with the scientific names and the uh, Borana name. And at the bottom are the pillars of Namura Tumbia, discovered in Kenya, right? Across the border from, uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, where they discovered these pillars that are prophetic pillars, but they didn't know who made them or what they meant. They had no idea. So what they found in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, all over East Africa, and in Ethiopia, is that there are uh, Roma built uh, pillars to mark the, the dead uh, uh, as, as to celebrate the, the deceased uh, relatives. Uh, not like that at all. They are thin and straight 
pillars and they are pointing in different directions. And for a hundred years, archaeologists were trying to figure out what these pillars are for, they couldn't. So two archaeologists from Michigan State University, Americans, went to Kenya, read my book, read the astronomical calendar, and said, aha, these things may be pointing to the sky to tell us where the stars are located at the time of their conjunction with the moon. They measured them, and they're exact to one, within one degree of error, one degree, every one of them. So then they found uh, uh, bones of animals. It changes the structure of uh, organic material over the centuries. So you can figure out the age of the, uh, of the site from that. So they dated the bone, and it turned out that the plant, the uh, pillars were planted 300 years before Christ. Which means the foundation of Gadar, the astronomical calendar, which is the foundation of Gadar, is two millennia old, and a contemporary of Aksum and the kingdom of Kush. And so now we have to start thinking, what is the connection between Borana, Oromo generally, the Kushites generally, and the kingdom of Kush in, in, in the Sudan? It's a great civilization uh, that has been found in, 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 in the Sudan. But people think that they are, they say they are Negroid people. Uh, I look at them and I say half of them are not Negroid, the other half is like uh, ordinary Kushites. So I, I say, you know, we have to explore what the connection is between Oromo and Kush, Kingdom of Kush. And there are all kinds of hints that I find that there are serious similarities between them. One of them is the emblems of power. All the emblems of power, in the picture of uh, the Aldis Liban, which I have here, I think, this one, the picture of Jaldis Liban, he's mounted on, on a horse, and on him are the, all the symbols of authority the, the, of what I'm Kalecha is the first one, tied to the forehead. Baruguda, which is the ostrich feather that's stuck in, in, on top of that. Uh, and then the long staff that the Bagadas uh, hold when you see them on television today. The long staff, that's called Oro. And then a short staff called Boku. Uh, and then the Licho is another civil authority. When they grow old, they are the Abutigra. They are called uh, uh, Licho Dolete, old, old, old witch is what they call it. Whip is a symbol of, for, for, for a nation of horsemen, whip is a symbol of, uh, of, of authority. All these symbols of authority have direct parallels in the kingdom of Kush and in ancient Egypt. The forehead emblem that the Kushites wear on their forehead, which is tied with a leather strap, with a knot at the back, and two streamers going back to the waist. The kingdom of Kush and the Egyptians tie the forehead emblem. Exactly the same way. So, these are not accidental. <laughs> These are too many similarities uh, that uh, cannot be ignored. And then beyond that, what I'm finding is that uh, the way they bury their dead also has very close relationship to the way they push out. And this is uh, crossed with symbols of authority in their hands, but they put them inside a box, which, which is. Uh, um, Sarcophagus, it's called. Uh, but the Cushitic method of burial is in a crouching position, not straight. Like, like an infant, the way it's the fetal position, that when a baby is born, it doesn't come out straight. It comes out curled up like this. And then you have to stretch the arms and legs. Because in the womb, they are, they are actually bundled up like this. Well, uh, among the Orma, the most, the most complete version of this is the Orma, 
a very good day, but they put my head between the legs and tied them together. So that is really the total people, people position. And then when they buried them, they, they, they dig the grave straight down and then have another room sideways. And they put the body in that, elevated from the ground, uh, and no earth must touch the body. So they seal it and put it on a bed and, uh, and keep protect it from being exposed to, to earth. Uh, so that method of burial exists among the Kush Kushans, the kingdom of Kush, exists among the Oromo, and it exists among the ancient Egyptians of pre dynastic times. So the, the pre dynastic Egyptians were the four elements. Later they developed crowns, big crowns. And big crowns are very problematic in the, in the desert environment. So the, the wind can blow, blow away your crown, which is terrible. <laughs> and so what they do is they put the crown on. No, before they do that, there's something called the Kushai cap, which is a leather cap, which they tie tightly, fits the, the, the head. And then you put the, the crown on top of that. And then you put like a letter on top of it to, to steady the whole thing. Together, so it's all it's all intended to to stay with The crown of Kappa was exactly like that. It was a crown. It was a conical silver crown uh, with silver chain in front. Because you're not allowed to see the face of the divine king, uh, so he sees you, but you don't see him. But otherwise, they have three connectors up front on top of the crown, uh, and uh, and tied with a with a with the rope and with the two stingers So, Kappa as well as Rome had ties with the kingdom of Kush, which is a whole new field for, for historical archaeology that we can, can begin to investigate. Thank you. Thank you.
Was it? 